Joe Varden from The Athletic joins us right now from New York City. Happy to have him join us. And he is in there um, fresh off of an exciting dinner last night with Tom Brady and uh, Wemby. We need to have all the details. I want to know what they had for dinner, how many courses, and did Tom eat dessert? Was there any refined refined sugar on the menu that you're aware of? That's all I really care about. Right. Well, I'm going to say no. I mean, between the way Tom Brady treats his body and the, and Victor's sleeping habits, I can only assume that he eats well. Um, I, I must not be a very good reporter because uh, I don't know what was on the menu. I can tell you I had a cheeseburger at J.G. Melons. If that, if that by the counts. way, delicious. <laughs> and by the way, delicious and one of the best burgers in the city. So very smart on your part. How did, so how did this happen? Like, what are you hearing about? How did this come about? Yeah, so... Um, We found out about it because Tom Brady tweeted a picture that looks funny. Uh, They almost look the same height. So I I don't know if there's a depth uh, trick going on there. But Victor is here at Madison Square Garden for shoot around. His first uh, media availability at any shoot around uh, as an NBA pro. And somebody asked him if indeed he met Tom Brady last night. And he said absolutely that he did. He talked about really enjoying the time and he called Tom Brady humble and interesting, but also as somebody who's interested in other people. Um, and then a Spurs official told me that this was a dinner set up by a billionaire, Michael Rubin. Uh, he's a co-owner of Fanatics and both Tom and Wemby are our clients. And so that's how they, that's how they came together. Uh, Victor said he knows a little bit about American football. He's learning more and he's, but he said, but he assured us all. He's like, I know about Tom Brady. Tell me what Wemby's like in person. And, and I'm curious, you know, I spent um, so long covering the Lakers and Shaquille O'Neal's 7'2", and that's the way I look at life. And we're talking about <laughs> another four inches. And, and yet he's such a slim guy. I'm so curious about what you feel like he's like in person. So I have found him to be incredibly engaging uh, and thoughtful and polished for a 19-year-old Parisian here in the United States. He speaks, I like to say that he speaks better English than I do. Um, But beyond that, he is somebody who will make eye contact and he will uh, consider your question and not necessarily go along with the premise. And I think all of those things are going to help him. Uh, Of course, it's not going to help him put the ball in the hole or, or block four or five shots a night. But just the idea of of being the number one pick and being uh, an international, uh, you know, athlete of interest. Now, I, I guess we can call him a star. He's on his way to rookie of the year. Um, but to be able to handle the, the the global attention and sort of the extra scrutiny here in the United States, the way he does is it's just going to make life easier for him. It'll it'll help him capitalize on various marketing opportunities. Um, and it'll help people like me to be able to explain to the average fan who he is. And so I think from that perspective, um, he really is off to a great start. It, it seems like the uh, kerfuffle at, um, at the Aria at, during Summer League with Britney Spears, like that was a lifetime ago. What's most fascinating to you about him? I mean, you've been covering this sport for a long time. It's got to be just the sheer size. Um, you know, think about he he might be, uh, depending on how tall you think he is, um, there's, there's you call him 7'6", uh, there's some talk about him being 7'5". At The Athletic, I was just told that, that we're going with 7'4", so somewhere in there. Um, but being that tall and having skill sets that could be compared to Steph Curry, um, who's well over a foot shorter uh, <laughs> than than Wembenyama, but just the ability to shoot, to move the way he does, and then again, I mean, you know, my uh, most of my NBA career has been spent following LeBron, um, and I was actually at LeBron's Madison Square Garden debut nearly nearly twenty years ago, covering it. And um, there's been a couple times where we've had a, a number one overall pick since uh, who who had a certain degree of hype. I would say that Victor is probably the most hype number one pick since LeBron and and the way that he is handling the the, the attention and 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 not being an American and 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 sort of um, the, the way he has put himself uh, on display and, and the way that he's able to communicate it is is impressive to me and, and interesting. I, I definitely want to know more about him. You mentioned LeBron James. What's his mindset right now at this point in the season? 
<laughs> that he's playing more minutes than he was supposed to. Uh, you know, that it, that's been a, an early an early storyline in the NBA and with the Lakers. And it goes back to opening night that I, against the Nuggets. I, I was there and LeBron plays 29 minutes. They lose uh, the, they outscored the Nuggets when he was on the court. And after the game, both he and his coach confirmed that this is the plan for the year, that he's going to play around 30 minutes, which would be way fewer than he's ever averaged in 20 previous seasons. He didn't sound happy about it, but but the idea is like they're trying to preserve this player who's still great, but he's about to be 39 years old. Uh, he's missed 110 games, something like that, over the last five years with the Lakers. And this minutes restriction lasted all of one game. Um, so they just, I don't, you know, it's, it's a, it's a combination of the Lakers not being as good as they thought they might be when he's not on the floor and, and also just the incredibly high level that he's playing and they've had some overtime games as well. So that's his mindset now is, is he's, you know, he's taking on a workload that, that we've seen throughout his entire career and, and he's just trying to get the Lakers into a good play into a good place. We'll talk about that load management as well in, in a minute, but I have to ask you. How is it possible that the Lakers are where they are when they put all that money into getting LeBron and AD and trying to build around him? I think it's almost head scratching. Is this a, is this just the way the team has been built? Do you think? I mean, it, if you're Genie Bus and you're sitting there knowing that the minutes are counting down for how much time you have LeBron James, are you just thinking I've got to restructure? What? I, I can't imagine what it's like for LeBron at this point to be sitting on this team the way it is right now, playing well, the way they I, are. I think that I think there's probably uh, some patience, you know, that for one of their starters, Jared Vanderbilt has been hurt all season. Uh, and he's a big, rugged wing defender that that uh, is good playing alongside LeBron. Um, and then you look at Austin Reeves, uh, who I spent a lot of time with this summer uh, on Team USA, who had a great summer for the Americans. And then it, he was one of those players you thought was really going to have a, a springboard year um, back in the States with the Lakers. And he actually hasn't gotten off to a very good start. So I think that's an issue. Uh, and then if some of their other ancillary pieces have been in, inconsistent. You know, there, there's, I mean, Gabe Vincent has, hasn't been as good as, as he was with the heat and, and he's had some minor injuries that he's been working through. So um, I'm not concerned yet about the Lakers. Um, you know, they historically have started kind of slow. Uh, the chemistry is a lot better there this year. Um, and, you know, Russell Westbrook was there the last two years and it just was a bad fit personality and game wise um, with him, and the Lakers. So he's happier now with the Clippers. The Lakers are happier without him. Um, so I, do, I don't think it's time to panic. Uh, I, I, it's a team that went to the conference finals last year, and on paper they got better. It's always um, time to panic if you're a Laker fan, don't you think? I mean, like, there's not a time where you don't panic. That's that's true. And you, like you said, the clock. I mean, for the first time ever, LeBron publicly considered retiring. It was after last season. Everybody knows about it, and obviously it didn't happen. But just the simple fact of him putting his own words to that idea really, you know, rang the bell that that the end maybe isn't maybe it's not where he's not on the doorstep uh, of of walking away, but it's it's in the conversation now. So, you know, the Lakers have a window uh, that's going to be open as long as LeBron's there. Uh, they need Anthony Davis to be upright. Uh, he's he was a little banged up the other night. So that's always a concern. But, you know, they they, they need to win now for sure. You were there for the James Harden opening salvo with the Clippers. I'm curious about this. At the end of the year, James Harden's year is a. Oh. Uh, well, I mean, every year that he's ever had has ended in disappointment uh, because of his playoff track record and the track record of the teams that he's been on. Um, so. You know, I guess history tells us that that's going to be the answer. I, I think uh, if there's a chance to get away from that word disappointment, um, he's got a coach in Ty Lu who is as creative as anybody in the NBA. Um, and he's somebody who has worked with these star teams before. And, you know, I, I like to make the point, Ty 
is a asking all four of these guys, Harden, Leonard, Paul George, and and Russ, that they have to sacrifice. Okay. But the other thing he's doing now is is when push comes to shove, he does want the ball in Kawhi Leonard's hands, which means he's going to ask a little more from the sacrifice perspective of the other three stars. My point is he's done this before. When he took over the Cavs in 2016, uh, they were in first place. They had just come off of finals. They had LeBron. They had Kyrie. They had Kevin Love. Um, and Ty had to sit those guys down. And he said, when push comes to shove, you, Kyrie, and you, Kevin Love, have to defer to LeBron. And they did. So Ty has a chance to make it work with the Clippers, and that's how that's how he will do it. And how will he massage the egos for that, do you think? Ty has a uh, tremendous, what is it, is, is the word cachet? Like, he, he has, he has uh, an abundance of respect among players because he was a player and he communicates with these guys as well as anybody in the league. So when Ty asks you to do something, they, they typically do it. Um, you know, I was in the bubble, uh, as one of the reporters there and every night, not, I guess not every night, but many nights, um, reporters and players would congregate outside at, at Disney and Ty would hold court with these players. And it wasn't just that he was an assistant coach on the Clippers at the time. And it wasn't just the players on the Clippers who would come sit with him. I mean, players from the Lakers, players from the Raptors and the 76ers, they would all come and just sit and hang out with him because that's who he is to these players. So he's got to rely on his personality and the respect that he's built up over a great career. Um, but it's, you know, it's, listen, James Harden, the day that he gets introduced as a, as a Clipper says, you know, I'm not a system player. I am a system. So the, it, it's, it's, it's not a, a small task to, to get uh, a players like that to, to buy in and to, to do, le- to take fewer shots and to move the ball more. But, um, you know, that James led the league in assists last year. So it's not like he doesn't know how to pass. And he wanted to come to the Clippers, so it's not like he didn't know who's on the team. So this is what he wanted. He got what he wanted, and uh, it's upon him to buy into what Ty has to say and and to get others to do so as well. Hey, Joe, Chris Brockman, a big matchup in the East tonight, Boston at Philly. What have you seen from these two teams early in the year? Well, uh, with Philadelphia, we have Nick Nurse, who um, has brought, I mean, he's just an entirely different style coach than Doc. Um, and they do some different things defensively. Uh, he's, you know, he's a little bit more of a, a game to game, you know, strategian, if you will. Is that a word? If not, it's okay. I can make these, make up these. these we'll let, we'll let it go this time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, he's a strategy guy, and and you don't always see that on the average night in the NBA, uh, but that's something that Nick likes to do, um, and he's getting a lot out of Joel for sure. Uh, Tyrese Maxey is is evolving and thriving, you know, uh, taking over for James Harden, so that's been great. Um, and then you said, and then the Celtics, right? Like they, they are um, incredibly deep again, but they look – like the, the the makeup of the team is different because of Drew Holiday and also because of uh, Porzingis, um, so they they certainly have as good of a starting five as as any in the NBA. And they have just you know I know they lost for the first time the other night, but they have been a dominant dominant group. TJ, hey Joe, TJ here as one of the rare Clippers and Sixers fans. Uh, since we're talking about the Clippers, want to know this: What do you, in your opinion, see the, the Sixers doing now? Do you see them maybe packaging those picks they got for Harden and getting another superstar this season? Do you think maybe they kind of ride this out for the remainder of this year and then maybe look towards next year, where I believe they have somewhere around like fifty-five million open to bring another star in? What, what do you think? the Sixers are going to do because I, I'm, I'm like nervous here right now. Well, I, I mean, I think I understand the nerves, but at the same time, um, I think you've got to feel very good about the start considering the tumultuous training camp that they had with the James Harden saga. You know, we all know Daryl Morey. 
we all know the big swings that he takes. And I mean, it wasn't too long ago that he was able to bring James to Philadelphia from the Brooklyn Nets off of a super team. So, you know, Daryl's track record suggests that there's another move coming. You very accurately uh, and and uh, eloquently describe the the um, the arsenal that 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 Daryl has to spend to bring that person back. Um, but he has time. You know, I mean, the February trade deadline is a long time from now. And in the meantime, this group is winning. And I think you want to see how good Tyrese Maxey gets. And you want to see, you know, how how much Nick gets out of out of the supporting cast. But, yeah, I mean, I expect them to make a move. You know, I mean, the the Raptors, Nick's former team, you know, there's a, there's a couple of players there if if the Raptors decide to to break it up. You know, you you monitor what's going on in Cleveland with with Donovan Mitchell. Um, not that the Cavs are looking to move on from him, but if I mean they're off to kind of a slow so so start, we'll say after beating the Warriors, but was a slow start. If if that were to continue, then there's a conversation there. And then you look at the Bulls; they have a couple of players that would all fit along Joel alongside Joel Embiid as well. So the 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 goal obviously is to win. And the goal is to keep Joel happy. That's the, the you know goal one and one a. Maybe they're one and the same. And uh, you know, as a strategian, you know, I'm sure Nick will figure it out. And, and one last thing, Joe, to just kind of close it on the Sixers. Do you think we'll ever find out what exactly went down with James and Daryl? Because they were seemingly such a, a great tag team, and then something definitely went awry. Do you think that? whatever happened really come to light? Did we know what, what really went down with those two that made Harden so angry? Well, listen, I've, I have never sat um, in a room with two of them uh, at the same time, just the three of us. And, and I, I wasn't there, you know, as the feeling soured, but I, I do feel like there, there, um, th- that there is an explanation and, you know, it's based off of what we've seen and heard publicly and also just some conversations I've had, but, you know, James Harden uh, last year, so heading in heading into uh, the previous season, took less money. Like he he could have he could have have had more money than he took from the Sixers. Uh, so they so so they could you know bring PJ Tucker on and and uh, and and build a team to to win. He was looking to be compensated for that. Uh, going forward. And I feel like the Sixers were ready to do something like that. Um, And then the season goes along and James um, basically flirts with the Rockets. And uh, I I don't know if it was a uh, negotiating ploy on on his camp's part or what the deal was there, but these reports began to surface and and there was traction there about, you know, James's interest in going back to Houston. Mm -hmm. Um, while all that's going on, the Sixers again fall short in the playoffs, and James really struggled, um, you know, to deliver. Like he, I mean, that's what his track record shows, uh, certainly over the last couple seasons and and for most of his career. Um, and then he goes and and the market dries up for him, especially in Houston, and that 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 option wasn't available. So now he's looking to be paid uh, what he thought was fair from the Sixers. They wanted to pay him less than what he was looking for, and with few with fewer years uh, available uh, on that contract, and that upset James um, to the point where he exercised his option with the idea then that he would force a trade. Um, the the Sixers didn't want to do that. Uh, they ultimately did. Um, but I, I feel like I feel like by and large, that's pretty close to what happened. Who intrigues you, Joe Varden? Who do you have next in your scope that you want to look into? Who are we not talking about or who's interesting to you, either a team or a player? Oh, my. Wow. <laughs> I, that's a great question. Um, that's why I sit in the chair. I mean, you know, <laughs> come on. Someone's going to ask the good questions here. Well, okay, you know what? I I I'll, I will answer your question. Uh, I did not see the Dallas Mavericks starting this way, uh, so good. And I also did not see, and maybe I should have, the Memphis Grizzlies getting off to as poor of a start as they have. So I'm looking to see if either trend continues. Uh, is this Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving pairing with really just role players? Um, you know, behind them, they, they never were able to get that third star 
uh, does that work? I mean, they missed the playoffs last year. Um, so how good are they going to be? And is, is does Kyrie, you know, last the full season, stay out of the, the controversy that he has found himself in? Does that work? And then with the Grizzlies, you know, while, while John Morant is out, I mean, they have two other stars who are playing well. Desmond Bain and Jaron Jackson Jr. are playing like themselves, but, you know, they just got their first win the other night. They lost their first six. Um, they, they sorely miss Steven Adams, who's gone for the year. And, and um, you know, they they traded away their sort of security blanket for, for John Morant and, and Tyus Jones. Um, and I feel like those two moves, you know, the the injury to Steven and, and losing Tyus has really hurt them. You know, Marcus Smart's there, but um, he's not he's a different player than than Tyus. And, and the way Tyus kind of held that group together the last couple of years when Ja was out is really how they were able to win games when when Ja was either hurt or in trouble. So can the Grizzlies get it together? And, and if they do, what will that look like, you know, come the springtime? I mean, I think those are two uh, really interesting storylines. Oh, let me just tell you the the answer to the Kyrie Irving. Will he stay out of a controversy? No, <laughs> it just doesn't ever happen. So let's just let me just finish that one up for you, Joe. Thank you so much. I wanted to talk Steve Kerr. I wanted to talk load management. Your articles for the Athletic are incredible. Thank you so much for your work and thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Oh, I enjoyed it, and I'll, I'll come back anytime. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, thanks so Joe. much. Love having him on. He is an incredible writer. Boom. Loved I mean. It. He answers everything you want, and he writes the most interesting articles. I think he's fantastic. I'm happy to have him on. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.